Hello. Good morning, church. Welcome. Do you want to stand and worship with us today?
Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift up your voice to him right now. Just tell him how thankful you are. Give him your praise. Give him your thankfulness. Right now, Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God. You're deserving. You're so worthy. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good to us. We're so undeserving of your love and your favor. Yet you give us to it every single day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Take me. 
come upon you, you would receive power to be my witness. You would receive power to be my witness. You would receive everything you need to go and be a witness everywhere you go, for it is the power of the Holy Ghost. It is my power. And that is my heart. My heart is for this world. And I have revealed it to you that my heart is for your families that do not know me. My heart is for the school that you go to. My heart is for this world. And you know the cost and the price. And you received power when the Holy Ghost came upon you to be my witness. And I'm sending you forth. I have sent you forth, but I'm sending you this day. I'm sending you forth. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. And I tell you, there is a move of God upon the face of the earth, and nothing will stop it. There is a move of God upon the face of this earth, and nothing will stop it. For there is a remnant that has gone forth. There is a remnant that has received the word of the Lord and has gone forth into this world and I call you forth as that remnant I call you forth as that remnant step in to what I've given you step in to what I've given you for you received power and you will be my witness and signs and wonders will follow you to bring glory to my name for as the waters Cover the sea, 
so shall the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover this earth. And I'm calling you forth in this hour. You pull me a little closer. You take me a little deeper. Wanna know your heart. Wanna know your heart. Cause your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. Wanna know your heart. Wanna know your heart. Cause your love is so much sweeter.
You know, you're in a church that believes that the book of Acts is still being written, that what God was doing in the early church, he's still doing. And he spoke to us this morning. If God spoke to us through individuals used in a prophetic gift, then perhaps we should just pay a little more attention. So let's consider for a moment what he said. What did he say? He said, the Lord your God is mighty in your midst. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He's mighty. He's here. He said his will can't be thwarted. He's going he's to go forward. He is bigger than every situation, circumstance, problem that you come against. He's mighty in your midst. He's mighty to save, to heal, to deliver, to do all those things. He also said that we would receive power after the Holy Spirit's come upon us. We, each one of you has the Holy Spirit if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is in you. But there's another element. He said, you're going to receive power. He told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they got that. They were believers, but they needed more, and so they waited. And he said he gives us power to be witnesses. How many in your family still need Jesus? How many in your school or at work need Jesus? He says God's called us to be a remnant in these last days, a remnant to accomplish what he wants, that we would go forward with that power that signs and wonders would occur. Why do signs and wonders occur? To be a sign, to be a signpost to other people that the God in us is the real God. And so he heals, and so he saves, but his biggest concern is for souls. The heartbeat of God is still souls. Souls. He wants people to know him. We're supposed to be making him known wherever we go. We've been given power to be a witness. You can speak to people about Jesus. You can tell them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them. You can communicate the gospel in a fresh and compelling and a powerful way. Let's pray for just a moment, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna have us pray for each other and pray for the sick. Let's take a moment. Maybe there's someone in your family that you've been praying for, and sometimes it's hard to witness to your own family, but you need to pray that God would put them in a position where someone can communicate the gospel of Jesus to them, and you can communicate the gospel to someone else. Father, use us. Help us to be that remnant in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, Lord, we pray for our families. We pray for our friends. We pray for our co-workers and the students that go to school with us, Lord, that don't know you, that aren't living for you, that are struggling in this life. To know Jesus, Lord, help us to tell them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them. Lord, the power of the Spirit gives us the ability to do things we could not do in our own strength. Thank you, Jesus, for saving our families. And while we're at it this morning, we pray for those down in Texas that have been inundated with all this water and rain and wind and storm. And Father, I know I read this morning there are people climbing on roofs in Houston because the rain has filled their house. Father, help them. Save them. Oh, Lord. Pray for the needs down there, Lord, that the uh, None would perish without knowing Jesus, and none would perish, Lord. Help the, Lord, the first responders and all those, oh God. Father, thank you that Convoy of Hope is going in down there, and Samaritan's Purse, and there's so many churches, uh, Lord, ready to do the work to step in. Father, thank you for helping those people. Pray for your favor. Let the rain stop. In the name of Jesus, if Jesus could command the wind to cease, why can't we pray that the rain stop? In the name of Jesus, wind and rain cease. Let them be amazed that this stopped. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now do me a favor, stand back to your feet. If you would like prayer, healing in your body or prayer for anything, I want you to raise your hand. And I don't, you know, if, if you haven't even raised your hand, I want you to turn to somebody, find somebody near you, and begin to pray for them. Say, can I pray for you? Just bless them. And if you'd like, pers you'd like me to pray for you, anoint you with oil, I'll be happy to stay right here and pray for you. Find someone and pray for them. If you need healing in your body, you need anything at all, you just say, please pray for me. You can communicate or share with it what it may be or not. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Jesus.
praise this morning. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, O oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You do wear the You won the victory, Lord. Every stronghold has come against you. It's in your life, has no authority to be there. It must be broken. He said you've given you weapons that are mighty through God to pull down strongholds and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Thank you, Lord. We receive it, Lord. Financial strongholds. Relational strongholds. Physical strongholds. Have no authority in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. name we win hallelujah we won he won thank you lord in the name of jesus in the name of jesus thank you lord thank you lord thank you jesus Turn around, tell somebody, give them a high five. Tell them that God loves them this morning. Welcome to First Assembly. Well, welcome. I know I'm a stranger. I've been gone for a couple, we've been gone for a couple Sundays and um, you know, um, if you haven't already done so, if you are on Facebook, turn on your uh, cell phone. I know you, most places tell you to quiet them. I tell turn it on and share. Go to fa your Facebook page and share our live stream. You know, it was such a blessing. We got up late. We intended to go to church, and uh, we were tired, and we got up late Sunday morning, and I turned on the live stream and watched uh, uh, Pastor Jim preach and the worship service, and it was an awesome service, and the last, the last Sunday I did the same thing. Uh, it was great. It's it great. What a great blessing. We have a good number of people watching us, so welcome to those who are watching uh, on, uh, on Facebook or YouTube, and uh, we're uh, glad to be able to do that, and it's, it is a blessing. So share that if you haven't already done so. Right. And um, uh, anyway, uh, we're glad to be back. You know, the, we're, we're really exciting people. The, uh, uh, the biggest decision we had to make uh, any day was uh, where should we go for dinner tonight? You know, so um, uh, we sit on the beach and read a book and chill out and don't do anything for two weeks. It was wonderful. And I know there's still a lot of people that are still gone. And uh, coming up to Labor Day weekend next weekend, our Master's Commission students will be starting to, to filter in this next week, right? So uh, they'll be here next week. So we're excited about another school year with our Master's Commission program, training young people for the ministry and, and then that discipleship in, with Jesus. So uh, uh, another great another great year this will be our 14th year uh, so this is a, it's a powerful thing so yeah give you know thank you you know without you we couldn't do it and um, you know your you know some of your mission support each week goes to help uh, uh, support that program and uh, other things and you take them in your homes and care for them and over the years we've had hundreds of students come through here so we're excited about the opportunity to train some more about Jesus so uh, also, today is a teacher and appreciation and graduation Sunday. So I would like every person here, if you, uh, if you work in the nursery or with the toddlers or the children's ministry, uh, I would like, and, and teach or work or whatever, uh, help, I would like you to stand up. We want to thank you for your service this year, okay? 
Thanks, stand up. I know there's more than that, because there's many more than that, so. And of course, some of them are up there working. So we thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment to our young people, to our children, and uh, uh, for making it possible to have an excellent program for each of those areas. So thank you. And uh, this is the day that uh, students, uh, you're going to a new a new school year, you'll be going up from, uh, maybe you'll be going from uh, elementary school to uh, middle school, and so, um, you know, be coming into the youth group. Uh, uh, Pastor Jacob has uh, meets uh, up in the chapel immediately when we dismiss our children's church. The uh, youth group meets in the chapel for a time uh, of uh, teaching and just uh, fellowship up there with them, so uh, don't forget to go up uh, to go up with them. Put one thing on your calendar as well. September the 10th, Sunday, September 10th, in about three weeks, uh, we're going to be meeting uh, at the family care picnic. We've rented a pavilion in Archdale, and uh, it's going to be at the uh, uh, big uh, park on in Archdale on 311 North, just before, just as you come into the city of Archdale on 311 from the south. The park will be there. You'll find us. We'll give you some more directions when we get a little closer. But put that on your calendar and uh, bring some food to share. We'll just have some games and fellowship and a great, uh, a great opportunity. So uh, also uh, next, let's see, tomorrow, today's a, in four days, uh, was it the 31st, uh, uh, Brad Tatum is starting a new class on uh, the Financial Peace University of Dave Ramsey's class on Thursday nights at uh, 6.30 to 8.30. So there's a sign-up sheet in the rear lobby, and so I invite you to do that. Um, Juanita Arnold is coming, and she'd like to share just something for a moment before we take our offering. Pastor, uh, honey, would you give her the microphone, please? I'm sorry. And Pastor Dave is coming to receive the Lord's tithes and your offering. So. Is it up? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to encourage everybody about paying tithes. Um, several years ago, people that have been here a long time know that I came home one day in September and my husband had lost his job. And it was a very, very difficult time for us. People in this church sewed into us starting a new business. And we, it was very difficult. We struggled. We struggled with paying our tithes. I would write out the check, have it in my purse to pay my tithes, and something would always steal my tithes. We paid it sometimes, we didn't pay it sometimes, but really never was what I wanted to be 100% faithful. But the Lord still blessed us, even with that effort. But one day, the Lord spoke to me and he says, I'm gonna show you a way to be 100% faithful. So this is what he told me to do. He told me to take my bill pay and to take my tithes um, bi-weekly out of my check because he said to bring in the first fruits. So my tithes is the first fruit of my paycheck. And what is amazing is that over the years, we were in such a deep financial hole. I feel like we would go up and slide right back down. Well, I came in the church this morning and sit down and the Lord says Juanita do you remember do you realize something I said what Lord he said you're not in the hole anymore do you realize that I said I hadn't even thought about it I hadn't even thought about how much one by one by one God has helped us to pay off bills one by one by one I have not only gotten a raise from a new position, I have also, the Lord has blessed me to be able to open up a little savings account. In 35 years of marriage, I've never been able to save five cent. And I'm not saying I'm on a Fortune 500 company or nothing, but the Lord is blessing it. And I just have to encourage everybody, if you're, if you're struggling, Ask the Lord to show you. On my own, I couldn't do it. I tried. I have wrote the check 10,000 times in my purse when I'd walk in the door. And the car would break. This would happen. That would happen. It, one thing after another. And now, you know, it's so amazing. I still have the same amount of money left over after my ties. But we're not starving. My bills are being paid. We're out of a hole. <laughs> so I just had to 
Uh, the Lord told me I had to say this right this second. <laughs> and um, I, I forgot one, one thing also. Where'd Silas go? There he is. Silas, stand up, and, and Noel, and I just uh, wanted to, they've just got back from their honeymoon, so congratulations to them, woohoo. I know I missed the wedding, I'm sorry, but we're glad to have him back, and now we've got an old married lady leading worship again, so yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Amen. Guys, why don't you come on down? That was a good testimony, wasn't it? I, I was thinking about this verse this morning in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, for we are as he is in this world. And I was thinking, what has God done for you? You know, think about it for a minute. What, is, what has God given to you? What has, see, this is, this is it this morning. The word of God says, for God so loved the world that he what? He, oh, he gave. For as he is, so are we in this world. If you're not a giver, you're not like God. Oh, oh, snap. If you're not a giver... If you're not a giver, you're not like God. You know, and sometimes we, well, I don't have to give. No, you don't, you don't have to give, but if you want to be like God, you're going to give. Oh, but I don't have the money to give. Juanita, amen? You give, and you give, and it'll be given back to you. You give, it'll be given back to you. I'm not, I'm not putting any pressure on you this morning. I just want to encourage you. Be like him. Amen. If you have your offering, hold it up with me and say this. I expect 100-fold return of all I give and I receive the blessing of the Lord as I give depressed oh joyfully as I give joyfully we get to give and give joyfully we don't have to be upset about it all right all right thank you Lord Lord we just thank you today for your word thank you Lord for all the blessings that you've given to us Lord God you are a giver thank you that we get to be like you in this world Lord, I thank you for blessing your people this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. not there but if you have um, that you uh, Bible app you can uh, go to that and you can follow along with the notes that are uh, I'm going to be using this morning I posted them up there already for you so uh, you can follow along with the Bible verses and the and the notes and um, you know so uh, you know it, you uh, 
go on vacation. I don't know about you, but when we, I go on vacation, uh, we just get away and just, uh, it's a good time to uh, uh, rebuild the relationship, just to spend some, some quality time with each other, with, uh, with the Lord, to pray and, and read, the, read the Bible. I take a, a translation that uh, I don't usually read. It's more of a novel, and I sit there and and read a number of you know chapters of time like like a book uh, you know you can sit there and read 15 20 chapters and it just kind of flows and just to get an overview sometimes and it's just just good to to spend some spend some time like that so the problem with that is then when um, now that I've had all this time to think about stuff I come back and and I'm full and that's really good but it's really bad for you so um, I'll, I'll try to keep it to a minimum this morning but um, uh, you know, in the, um, well, for a long time, at least it seemed to be, years ago, that people always had a, uh, a big question that they always wanted to know the answer to, the basic question of, of life. If they ever spent any time thinking or pondering, you know, meditating in their lives, and the question was always, you know, uh, how did I get here? why am I here, where am I going? And um, back in the 60s, this led to the rise of something called TM, Transcendental Meditation, uh, Eastern Religions. You sit, you know, in a lotus position and, uh, you know, um, you know, meditate on your navel, you know, and, uh, and it also led to the rise of... Uh, uh, People taking hallucinogenic drugs, LSD, peyote, anything that they could get to uh, to help get a better understanding about themselves, and and uh, um, and and I I think that all kind of stopped somewhere along the way, and and people got busy with life and you know making money and and um, um, and now people are just consumed with themselves, you know. If you look at Facebook, which um, your teenagers aren't looking at Facebook, they're on Instagram and Snapchat. But you look at Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, any of those things, people are consumed about themselves. I mean, all I see is a thousand selfies of the same people. I mean, every two seconds, look at me, 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 look at me. And, uh, um, you know, it's just, I think, I don't know, that there's, uh, we've, gotten, we've gotten so self-consumed. It's, uh, I don't think we have time for uh, relationships. It's all, it's got to be about, it's about me. And, and, but the question still remains, and I want to talk to us this morning about, why did God create you and me? Why were we created? And if you'll turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 11, I'll show you. And I put the King James up because it says it in a, in a manner that uh, goes along with what I'm trying to say this morning. And, and it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they were created. So the short answer is, why did God create us is for his pleasure. For his pleasure. Um... Colossians 1.16 says it another way, but it essentially says the same thing. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and what? For him. For him. Hmm. And one more kind of foundational scripture. I want you to turn to the book of Genesis. In the first chapter, I think you can probably find that one. And verse 26, 
we'll begin with. And God said, let us. That us is plural, by the way. Okay. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let man, them, have dominion. Pastor Jim talked about that a couple weeks ago, about authority. All right. Have dominion. That is, they're going to rule with authority over the fowls of the air. Did you know you have authority over the fowls of the air? The cattle, that's all the animals. Over all the earth, that includes hurricanes as far as I'm concerned. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and here's what you're to do. Replenish the earth. Now, there's a thought. Someday we'll talk about that. What did that mean? Replenish. How can you replenish something that wasn't plenished in the first place? Hmm, there's a thought. And subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and over every living thing, and everything that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is on the face of the earth, every tree which is the fruit of the tree, so you shall have it to, for, for, for food. And verse 31, I also want you to see, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was good. Very good, thank you. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So God created man and woman. He gave them dominion, authority over all of his creation. And we know that, you know, Adam gave it away. Pastor Jim talked to us about that. Thought that was an excellent sermon, by the way. And, uh, and we regained it by faith because Jesus Christ took it back. And by faith, we have now re-received what we lost through Adam. And I won't go into all that, but suffice it to say that God created us with authority. But it comes back to the question, why did he make us? What is our purpose for existence? Now, I can say for his pleasure, but here, here's some things you, you need to understand. We were made in the image of God. Okay, isn't that what it says? We have the ability to know God. Adam walked with God in the garden, in the cool of the garden, it says, and talked to him. Human beings have the ability, therefore, to know God, to love him, to worship him, to serve him, and have fellowship with him. Now, Understand something. God did not create man because he needed us. Okay? As God, what does he need? Nothing. Stay with me. In all of the eternity before he created man, God felt no loneliness. He was not looking for a friend, Facebook or otherwise. He loves us, but that's not the same as needing us, okay? If we had never existed, God would still be God, who is the unchanging one, Malachi says. He's called the I Am in Exodus. He was never dissatisfied with his own eternal existence, right? When he made the universe, he did what pleased himself. And since God is perfect, his actions were perfect. He saw all that he made, and it was very good. Are you still with me? Okay. So he, didn't, he wasn't looking for a friend. He wasn't lonely. He, you know, I feel so alone out here all by myself. I need a friend. That's us. That's not him. Also, God did not create peers, equals to himself. First of all, logically, he couldn't do that. If God were create, 
to create another being equal to himself in intellect and perfection, then he would cease to be the one true God. Because now there would be two gods. And, and besides that, uh, it would be impossible. The Lord is God. Beside him, Deuteronomy says, there is no other. So anything that God creates must of necessity be like Arthur Burt said, subject, lesser, subject to the greater. Anything that God makes is lesser than the God. He's the greater. We're the lesser. The thing that was made can never be as great as the thing that made it. Now, we recognize, I'm saying all this, I'm getting to a point, just stay with me. God is sovereign. He can do what he wants. He has the capacity to do whatever he wants. He's in charge. It's unquestionable. He's also holy. And so we are amazed that God would make a man and crown him with glory and honor and that he would condescend to call us friends. And think of that. Think of what, what that means. The awesome God who created the universe, who always was, always is, always will be, decided one day for his own reasons and purpose to create something from nothing, and he would crown it with, with glory and honor, and he said, I'm going to call that my friend. Do you know how blessed you and I are to be called a friend of God? Now, so why did God create us? God created us for his pleasure, and so that we, as his creation, would have the pleasure of knowing him. Ooh. Ooh. Hmm. Huh. Being created for God's pleasure does not mean that I was made to entertain God or provide him with amusement, although I think he laughs at our stupidity sometimes. God is a creative being. It gives him pleasure to create. Hey, this is kind of deep, so stay with me. It's going to get shallower in a minute. But there's a deeper God who is a personal being. We talk about God in three persons. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, the creator God, is a personal being. And it gives him pleasure to have other beings he can have a genuine relationship with. Adam was created to rule, to multiply, to be the little g God of this world, not Satan. But more importantly, he was created by a loving Father, Creator God, to love that God of, of his own free will and to have the capacity to have an ongoing relationship, a personal relationship with a God who made a universe. So it's about relationship. Why was I created? For relationship. For relationship. Now, if you go on Facebook, which I don't do, there's a little, if you make a profile, though I understand a little of it, and in the profile, if you go to Courtney's and Jacob's profile, it says they're in a relationship. Right? Right? Huh? Oh, it says engaged. Excuse me. Sorry. See, that's how much I know about Facebook. Okay, so. so they're in a relationship. I have to ask you, what's a relationship? I won't ask you, but what's a I ask you, what's a relationship? A relationship. 
it means somehow they're connected. It means some... Now, are there good relationships and are there bad relationships? Yes, okay. Somehow I'm connected to you, either good or not so good. What does that mean, relationship? Let's talk about a good relationship. It means somehow we're intertwined. Um, it means I care about the other person. It means I spend time with that person. It means I love that person. I'm generally concerned about their welfare. I want what's best for them. I want to talk to them. I want to spend time with them. I want to uh, be around them. It's a good relationship. It's interconnected. Um, when uh, Chad and Wendy uh, got married recently, they did something I hadn't seen before. A lot of times, we we've traditionally over the years used to use a unity candle. You had two side candles that were lit by the, the bride and the groom's mother. And then we had one candle in the middle. And somewhere during the ceremony, they would take those individual lights and go to the middle light and light a new candle and blow those two separate candles, extinguish them. And now there would be one candle. The two became one. And... Um, they were connected. In Wendy and Chad's wedding, they did something different. They had uh, three strands of rope. And the Bible says a cord of three strands can't be broken. And the center strand represented God. And the two outside strands represented each of their individual lives. And during that ceremony, they went over to the rope and they, they intertwined the rope. They, they braided it together. And so now it was one rope. That's relationship. That's connection. We're interconnected. When Adam fell, he fractured our relationship with God. And now God had to send Jesus to mend that relationship to reconcile us back to the one we were intended for to begin with, our, that relationship, through Jesus Christ. We can only reflect the, the reason that we, the reason people are in such turmoil. You know, somebody said a long time ago that people are searching for something, and they, they try to, they have this hole inside of them, and they try to fill this hole with sex and with drugs and with alcohol and, you know, all kinds of things. They try, to, they try to fill it with Eastern mysticism. They try to fill it with astrology. They try to fill it with mysticism and, and, and you know, whatever. But it's only been, it's been made in the shape of the only thing that can fill it that will put in there right is Jesus. And so God, we were created for this relationship with God. And the only way we can have that is to, to fill that void with Jesus. Now I can have a relationship with the, with the creator God that I was intended to have from the beginning. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, put that up. This is called in Hebrew, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. One Lord. One Lord. I want you to notice something. In this verse, this now this is the this is the crux of every prayer that the that the Levites prayed, that Aaron prayed, that the Jews still pray. This is the most important verse in the Torah to the Jew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I'll translate it for you in Hebrew. The Jehovah, Jehovah. Our Elohim is one Jehovah. So it mentions God 
three different times in one verse. Why not just say Jehovah is one? Why well, say Jehovah, the Elohim, is Jehovah? Because God is triune, and he's revealing himself that way even to the Jew. He's three exists in three parts. Okay? The, the puzzlement to every Jew, if you talk to a Jewish scholar, they don't understand why God's name is mentioned three times here. Well, we have a revelation on that, don't we? It says in, in Genesis 1, <laughs> the Lord said, let us make man in our image, plural. God is a relationship of three persons in one, un in one unified Godhead. I know it's getting deep. Stay with me. How can that be? It's beyond the scope of our ability, but I, let me ask you a question. If you multiply one times one times one, what do you get? There you go. So the creation is a reflection, even mathematically, of a truth. So stay with me. Our creator, I'm going somewhere, I promise I'll get there. Our creator is in a relationship called the Trinity. And don't let anybody else tell you, try to tell you, there are three distinct persons make up one Godhead. Some people teach that the Godhead exists, it's the same element, but over here he exists as vapor over here for take water for example here he exists as vapor here he exists as ice here he exists as a liquid but it's all the same you know element it's not over here god the father is over here god the son is over here god the holy spirit is there are three distinct and unique persons of one godhead they're not the same element they're god but they're distinct personalities god is in a relationship with himself now, God gave us the commission, the authority to rule over all of creation. He gave us the dominion mandate to fill the earth. He told us to multiply, to fill the earth, make more living beings, make them in the same image they have to as God. Why? So every one of them can learn what Adam had, that you can have a personal relationship with God. We were created to be in relationship with God. It's about relationship. So the second part, though, of why I am here is to help others Find a way so that they too can have what I have found is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what the word of the Lord was this morning. There's a remnant, and we've been called because the heartbeat of God is souls. He's made all of this creation. He wants them to know him. That's our mandate. In fact, you can find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Put that up. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them because if they'd ask for forgiveness. And he has committed to us the message or the ministry of reconciliation. Why am I here? I'm here to have fellowship with God. Why am I here? To help others have that same fellowship. The ministry of reconciliation. You may not be called to the full-time ministry, but you are called to a ministry, and it's the ministry of reconciliation to reconcile men's hearts back to God. I got one amen. Now, let me tell you a story. Years ago, I won't even tell you how many years ago. It's getting... We... We're called, Connie and I, to start, to restart, really, a church. And there was five old people in that church that would have been left. They'd, they'd started it out of another church, with about 70, and they'd dwindled down to about five, and they were going to close it. And anyway, we wound up as a pastor. 
And in that town in Northeast Ohio, outside of Cleveland, there was a Greek Orthodox church with a gay priest. There was a Byzantine Orthodox church. There was a Ukrainian Orthodox church. I'm not sure if there was a Russian Orthodox church or not, but there were two Catholic churches, two major Catholic, every, most, most everybody in Northeast Ohio, but my point is, is, is Catholic or Orthodox. There was one Methodist church, one Baptist church, a Nazarene church, a Disciples of Christ church, and us. Well, there was actually a second Methodist church. It was across the street from us, but it was empty, and we, were rent, we would rent out the building from them. So I'm saying all of that to say that to grow from five people into a community filled with Orthodox and Catholic Christians, who do you think we got as people to come into the church? Those people. The most zealous convert that you can get, the most anti-Catholic person you can ever have to know would be somebody who used to be a Catholic. I wouldn't say some of the stuff they said against the church, but they felt they had been lied to. But Connie developed a way to communicate to these people, you know, to talk to them about relationship, you know, well, to talk to them about God. Because here's the great thing. I thought that was a hard area, frankly. But I'm convinced that this is harder. Because down here, everybody knows Jesus. Oh, yeah. You saved? Oh, yeah. Said that prayer of my grandmother when I was four. Haven't been in church since, but God knows I'm saved going to heaven. Thank God. But these people didn't know if they were going to heaven. They hoped it. They felt like, you know, but here's the good news. They believed in the Bible. They just didn't know they could read it. They believed in miracles. They believed that it was a sin not to go to church. <clears throat> Maybe you could tell the rest of your friends. They didn't go anyway, but they, they knew it was a sin, but they would get forgiven for it. I guess maybe that's what they're doing. I don't know. I give absolution this morning to all of them who are gone. Watch them, watch them by TV. But, ouch. But, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry. Just came out. I don't know where it came from. I just... Mm. They believed in prayer. They believed in lighting candles. But they didn't know if they died whether they'd actually go to heaven. They, 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 they hoped that maybe someone would say enough prayers or pay enough money to the priest to say enough masses that maybe someday they'd get there. And, um, and so what she discovered was the way you witness to a Catholic is to tell them, Does, did you know? I believe in God too, but did you know something? Know what? You can have a personal relationship with God. <gasps> no, he's up on a cross. He's dead. No, no, no. There's, the cross is empty. The grave is empty. Uh, Jesus is alive. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But you can have a personal relationship. Really? I've told this story before, but it, it bears repeating. But we were at a Billy Graham crusade in 1990 at uh, Cleveland Collis, the Cleveland uh, uh, Memorial Stadium where the Browns used to play before they tore it down. And um, anyway, there's a hundred and some thousand people in this auditorium, this, this, this place. And Billy Graham is preaching a sermon, and he he talked about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And he told people that if you died today, the, you, if you died this afternoon on the way of leaving this place, you could know of a certainty that you would be in heaven with Jesus the moment that you passed away from this earth. And there were four nuns sitting in front of us. And they didn't know that. 
And when he talked about personal relationship and the fact that they could die and go to heaven of a certainty, they looked at each other and it was as if four little light bulbs went off over each one of their heads. And when he gave the altar call, when Billy Graham gave the altar call, they got up and they went down and got saved. Because they didn't know that. I can have a personal relation. You mean I don't need the priest? I can talk to God myself? I mean, after all, what is a relationship? It's talking with somebody. We were in the car for 11 hours two Sundays ago and then coming back with nobody on the radio to listen to, just the sound of her own voice. I had to talk to her for 11 hours. That's relationship. I wanted to talk to her for 11 hours. Most of the time. You mean I can talk to God and he'll hear me and he'll answer me. I'm able to have a personal relationship with the one who crawled, created all this and called it very good. Yep. Now, one more point with this. Do you remember me teaching about the tabernacle of David in here? Okay. Remember when David brought the ark into Jerusalem and he put it up on Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount where it is today, and he pitched a tent over it and he put it there. And do you remember what the one distinctive difference between David's tent and Moses' tent was? Say it louder. No veil. There's no barrier between the individual, between the priest and the people, and the presence of God. The ark, on top of the ark, the mercy seat with the seraphim with their, with their wings outstretched, and here's the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God is, is there over the ark. And David would come in, and he'd sit in the presence of God. No barrier. No priest necessary. He could worship God and have fellowship with God. Do you know what God said about David? Did he call him a murderer? Did he call him an adulterer? Wasn't he all those things? Did he call him a powerful king? Put that verse up, 1 Samuel 13, 14. Samuel is talking to um, Saul and said, your reign is over as king because the Lord has found him a man. Mm, there's another verse. Maybe it's 15. Okay, maybe I gave you the wrong verse. I got it right here. It's 13, 14. Did you get 13, 14? Okay, there must be more to it. Keep going. No? Okay, well, this is what it says in my Bible. I don't know what that is up there. Now your kingdom will not continue. For the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has made him to be captain over his people because you have not kept the commandments of the Lord. So what did God say about David? He was a man after his own what? Isn't that what relationship is about? After his heart? They have a heart for each other. They have a heart for each other. At least that's what they say. Just kidding. When you're in a relationship, you have a heart for somebody. What did, what did God tell us in, in the commandments? He said that he'll have no other God. We're supposed to love God with all our what? Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not just mind, but heart. See, God looks on the heart. Heart speaks of 
relationship. He didn't call David a, a great king, a rich man, a powerful man, a murderer, an adulterer, all those other things. A man, he, man what? A man after his own heart. That's what impressed God. That this flawed man, this flawed woman, this flawed person would be someone who would be the seeker after God's heart. Now, I've said all of that to get to a point. I know you were hoping I would get there soon, right? While I was on vacation a couple weeks ago, I woke up one night and lay there praying. It was early in the morning, about 4 o'clock. Couldn't sleep. Started praying, prayed in the Spirit quietly. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, you know, you've taught my people about faith. You've taught them about signs and wonders. You've taught them about my blessings. You've taught them about how that I am a God who is a rewarder of those who seek me. I desire to bless my people. The favor of God is theirs. And this is no reflection on you. Maybe it's a reflection on me. But the Holy Spirit said, have you ever wondered why it takes so long for God's people to catch what you're selling? I'm not selling, but giving away. Why does it seem like you say the same thing over and over and over again and so few people actually catch it. He said because they're trying to catch it here. And it can only be caught here. You're teaching their minds. And your minds must be renewed by the word of God. There's no question about that. But how is it, he said, that Joshua, Moses, were so blessed? All the great women and men of the, of the past. How is it that Seymour, as Azusa Street, saw so many creative miracles? Why did men like Wigglesworth and, and John G. Lake, and why did women like Maria Woodworth Eder and Catherine Kuhlman experience such awe-inspiring wonders in their ministries? And he said, because the one thing they all had in common was that they were in love with Jesus. They had a deep Abiding relationship with me because what he said to me was everything that you're teaching the people flow out of relationship if you have a relationship with someone you love them unconditionally you're 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 in awe of them you want to be with them you spend time with them do you think you would have any trouble believing God for the most amazing miracle that would ever come to pass in your life if you were in a relationship with someone who could provide that that miracle for you no you'd absolutely faith would be there you can't catch it here you have to catch it here it's about relationship Everything flows from there. I mean, think about it. When you read the, the, the Gospels, what's the one thing you notice about Jesus? He would minister to the people. He'd break bread and, and, and feed 5,000. He'd feed 4,000. He'd speak to the wind. He, he, he would heal a demoniac. I mean, all, the, all these things. And you know what he did as soon as he was done? He went up on a mountain and got alone with God. You know, we read verses, David read it this morning, as he is, so are we supposed to be in this world. Well, how was Jesus? Jesus said, I only say what I hear my Father saying. I only do what I see my Father doing. So what was he? He was an extension of his relationship with the Father. He was in such fellowship, such communion with God, that all he heard was the voice of God. All he saw was the hand of God moving, and so that's what he did. 
If you were in that kind of relationship, you could do the same thing. And that's how the generals in the past, that's how the great men and women of faith in the past. You know, I sat here and on Wednesday night, I'm teaching on prayer, and I was talking about praying in the Spirit this last week. I'm going to finish it up this week and be finishing up prayer in two weeks, and then we'll be moving on to another subject. And I was reading Oral Roberts's account of how he built Oral Roberts University in the city of faith. And it was what he said was he had gotten a word when he was 17 years old that he was supposed to build a university for God. He didn't even know what a university was. He didn't know how to do it. He just kept hearing the word, you're going to build me a university, build me a university, build me a university, build me a university. But he said in order to have his relationship with God was he would walk and pray. And while he was walking one day, he was praying in the spirit, praying in tongues. And then he would pray for the interpretation Julie Lambert went to Oral Roberts. She, she, she said that uh, university, she said he used to teach a class on the Holy Spirit, and he used to talk about this all the time, that it's one thing to pray in the Spirit, but it's another thing to pray with the understanding. So after you've prayed in the Spirit, you need to know what God's been speaking through you about. So he prayed for the understanding, and so God gave him one day. He finally got it. He saw the vision. He said, while I was praying in the Spirit, I got the understanding as I asked for it. And immediately I saw how to build a university. Couldn't have done it in my own strength, but he could do it with the strength of God. You see, it flowed out of relationship. The miracles that he, that he manifested in his ministry, all the tremendous healings, the salvations, all that stuff flowed because he had a relationship first with God. He loved the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus had a relationship with the Father. I said a few weeks ago that the Lord was saying we needed to be like Paul. Remember, I preached about knowing Christ. I want to know Christ. Paul said at the end of his life, a man who wrote most of the New Testament, he said the one thing he would like to have is a greater knowledge of God. Surely he had a good one, (laughs) you know. Jesus knew the Father. Adam was created, and so were we to have a relationship with a loving God. So I don't apologize for sharing with you faith and miracles and signs and wonders and all this stuff, but the Lord has told me today to tell you I'm to teach you about relationship. All that other stuff will flow out of relationship. How do we believe? How do we see the power of God manifest through us? Get to know God better. How do you do that? Well, if a young couple meet and they feel attracted, something pulls them together, how do they, how do they get to grow that relationship? They spend time with each other. They talk to each other. They involve themselves with each other. We, we, we talk about young couples being joined at the hip for crying out loud. Can't they ever get away? Well, they want to be together. They're in a relationship. They're engaged. <laughs> How do we improve the relationship we have with our friends? We spend more time with them. I'm not, I'm not trying to put a time constraint or anything like that. Don't misunderstand me. God will take what you give him and use it to, and magnify it. But, but the Lord is saying, if you want to have a relationship with me, spend some time with me. We love them. You know, we, and in a relationship, we forgive them. And God is, here, here's something else. There were two parts of the law, Jesus said. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't have a relationship with God, a loving, caring relationship with God the Father, and hate your brother, no matter what color they are. That needs to stop. We forgive them. We talk to them. And as that relationship deepens, 
I think one of the greatest things you can do to have a relationship grow is to learn how to be a listener. The whole world is saying, look at me, listen to me, look at me, listen to me. If only someone would listen. You want to you wanna, you wanna become one of, the, one of the best friends somebody could have? Listen to them. And actually listen and care. Don't, don't think of what you're going to say next while they're trying to talk to you. Shut your mind off or that part of it and listen. The Lord is saying, if you will dare to take this word, I'm just about done with it so you can, guys can come up, and become doers of it, we will deepen our relationship with God. And we will see a new avenue of power, a blessing, of favor open up to us like nothing we have ever seen before. Everything is going to flow out of this relationship. And the question is, how? And I want to finish with this verse in John. I want you to turn to the book of Gospel of John, chapter 15, and it's verse 14. And I've got the, the Holman Bible here, and it says this, Remain in me. King James says, Abide in me, and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, so neither can you all, unless you remain in me. You can't produce fruit by yourself. You need to be connected to the head. I'm the vine, he says. You are my branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Say much. Much fruit. The power of God the resources of God, the souls that need to be saved. You are going to produce much fruit. If, how? If you remain in him because you can't do anything without me. You think you can do it in your own strength? Impossible. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. Try to do it in your own strength, it gets worse. They gather those, they throw them into the fire and they're burned. But if you remain in me and my word remain in you, whatever you want, ask whatever you want. Say whatever. Whatever you want, and it'll be done for you. Now, how's that? Is that a good one? My Father's glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to me, prove to be my disciples. As my Father has loved me, I also love you. That's relationship. Remain in my love. And finally, verses 16 and 17, you did not choose me, but I chose you. You think you did. I appointed you that you should go out and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain. So again, he says it twice in the same chapter. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And this is what I command you. Love each other. Love God. Talk to him. Spend time with him. Open up to him. Trust will grow. Faith will grow. Relationship will grow. And your heart, with all your heart, not half-hearted, with all your heart. And finally, remember this. We've been called part of the fruit that we're supposed to, supposed to produce. The reason you have received power is to be a witness. You have a ministry of reconciliation in this world. We were divorced by sin. Our relationship was broken. We were separated from God. But now we've been brought together again. We've been reconciled by the sacrifice of Jesus. And out of that relationship, out of our life with Christ, should bear fruit. The love of God, the love of others, so we can produce more lives saved so that they too can know the personal God that we know. And that they can show others God. And so on and so on and so on. They can live like David did. We can live like David did in his presence every day. Do you realize what God is saying to you and me today? If we will deepen our relationship with him, all things will be possible. Our faith will enlarge. Our power will expand. Our love will grow. And his favor and his presence will be seen in us. And our revelation of him will grow until it has no end. And there will be no ebb to the revival that God is bringing. I want them to play this song while you have your heads bowed this morning. We sang it earlier. It's called Closer. 
Take me a little deeper. Bring me a little closer. I want to know you, Lord. Sing it. closed if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior just lift your hand to God right where you are we'll pray with you believe God with you. anybody need to get right with God this morning we weren't designed to be separated we were designed to have relationship with God the Father Father, we ask you, Lord, if there's anything that's separating us from having that relationship, Lord, forgive us and cleanse us. We want to heal that relationship. And Father, if we have a bad relationship with our friends or relatives or brothers, Lord, help us be the healing agent. You help us heal those relationships so that they can know the God that we know that loves in spite of flaws and fractures and issues. Lord, we want to know your heart. That was the song. We want, we want to be like David. We, we want to have you say about us what you said about your servant David. I have found a man after my own heart. And Father, as that relationship grows, as we take your words to heart this morning and we do it, we become doers of your word. Lord, we might only have 15 minutes sometime. We got busy, we got children, we got lives, we got jobs, we got school, we got all these things pressing in on every side. But Lord, we want to know you. We want to know you more. Help us. Lord, we're going to prioritize our time so we can spend some time with you. And Lord, take the time we do give you and multiply it. And show us and give us revelation of who you are. And that out of that revelation will flow power and dominion and authority and strength and faith and love and grace and favor. All those things that we need to see. Thank you, Father, that we can have a relationship with you. Stand to your feet this morning. Sing it one more time, Noel. Sing it with her. Take me a little, little deeper. deeper. I want to know you. so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know your heart. want to know your heart. Love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know Father, these are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You are their father, and they are your children, and therefore they are heirs and joint heirs with your son, Jesus, to every promise you have made. Their homes are blessed, their marriages are blessed, their families are blessed, their finances are blessed. They're walking in the divine favor of their God. Their bodies are blessed, Lord. Your favor rests upon them, and I bless them with the powerful, matchless, mighty name of Jesus. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and He loves you with an everlasting love. We give you praise. And all God's people said, Amen. Give Him some praise. Thank you, Lord.